Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Jeff Dorobensky from the International Center for Youth Gambling Problems and High-Risk Behaviors at McGill. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the Rash Cowan Lecture Series, uh, which is run in collaboration between our center and the National Council on Problem Gambling. Uh, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce and welcome Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones uh, to present today. Uh, Henrietta is a medical doctor and a psychiatrist and a neuroscience researcher working as a consultant psychiatrist in addictions while she leads two national clinics in the UK. Uh, she was appointed officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire in the 2019 New Year's Honors for Science Services to Addiction Treatment and Research. Dr. Bowden Jones is the current president of psychiatry in the Royal Society of Medicine, as well as the founding director of the National Problem Gambling Clinic, the first national health service treatment center in the UK for those individuals who are experiencing gambling problems. Uh, she's been the recipients of numerous awards, including the Psychiatrist of the Year Award from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, Dr. Bowden Jones is an honorary professor in the Faculty of Brain Sciences at the University College of London and honorary senior visiting research fellow in the Department of Psychiatry at Cambridge, uh, as well as being a trustee of the Royal Society of Medicine. Uh, she has numerous publications, is called upon internationally for her expert advice and for presentations worldwide. She's uh, also uh, been on numerous committees for the World Health Organization. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Henrietta Bone jones Thank you again for participating. Oh, thank you, Jeff. And can I just say really, truly a big thank you, because I don't think any of this would have happened if it hadn't been for all the help I had from you personally um, through all the years at the beginning, before, before I even started the first ever clinic. Uh, I came to you with at least 500 questions and you took and you had and you took so much of your time to advise me um, and I really learned everything everything I brought back to England as I had no colleagues there who who had done a similar thing uh, it came from you know from the conferences when we met and all the information you you and Alex really actually were the two key figures with Mark Potenza who really helped so I'm very grateful to you this is going to be it's a very full talk in the sense that a lot has been happening in England there couldn't be a better time for me to rant and rave about a lot of things uh, but also to be rejoicing in a lot of wonderful things that are happening and uh, there will be time for questions later I'm very keen to answer you know anyone's questions about specific issues but I'll cover quite a lot um, and um, and that's it really sorry I'm just trying to move forward now and my arrow was working and now it's not working let me see let me see why it's not, I, I'll use the mouse, sorry, let me just do it this way, great. So I'll give an overview about the reasons why I became interested in this area. I'll talk about setting up the clinic, and then I'll talk about the clinic going from one in 2008 to about eight at the moment, and by 2024, there'll be 15. Um, I'll talk about land-based to online, because I lived through these changes in the last 15 years and then there's quite a bit of politics and uh, the gambling review that I'll tell you about it's like gambling gossip really I suppose um, in a good way and nothing that I'm going to say is not to be shared but it's interesting so this is a very low quality picture of um, the clinic um, as, as it is now it's near the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital where I did my training where I met my husband where I gave birth to my kids it's basically you know the hospital um, where a lot of my life is spent and this is the addictions clinic slightly to the side about five minutes walk away it's on five floors it's really is a massive thing and um, and we have a, a few other services not many but we do have the National Center for Gaming Disorders here that I run as 
as well, as well as uh, some club drug clinic and something else. Um, so I, I, why do I have this large bird here at the beginning of such a talk? Because one of the things that I've really been helped by in terms of understanding the gambling world, the world of behavioral addictions and addictions in general, has been the interaction between clinicians uh, and experts by experience, as well as then um, these conversations being picked up by the media, also on Twitter, and ultimately we have managed to generate a community that nurtures new talent, new students, but equally helps people who might have a problem, who want to have the facts. What are the facts about my illness? Do I have an illness? Everyone seems to be turning towards Twitter. And so I now disseminate a lot of educational opportunities through my role as president of psychiatry at the Royal Society of Medicine. So attach yourselves to this if you want to expand your knowledge about all that is addiction and addiction psychiatry. Um, here we are, this is Milan in the 60s when I was born, beautiful cathedral, and life was pretty easy for quite a long time. I was in the back of mopeds by the age of 11, uh, being told off by my parents, you need to do some studying, it's dangerous to be on a moped, etc. But things were still pretty good until um, a lot of my friends started injecting heroin, and I was very young then. Um, and what happened was that the heroin epidemic that absolutely devastated Spain, Italy, Portugal, France, was uh, causing victims in all walks of life, all ages and all walks of life, but a lot of very young people. And it was uh, so horrendous that I remember walking to school and having to step over people injecting. That was a regular every morning activity. And I remember playing in the park in Milan every weekend, but needing to move the blood filled syringes to the side of the road uh, or to the side of the grass in order for us to play. So it was that sort of thing that I grew up in. And then when people say, why did you become interested in addiction psychiatry? I think it's really about, well, I didn't end up, you know, being someone who suffered from addictions, but ultimately you can understand without being a psychoanalyst that maybe wanting to help those who did, many of whom I've known and loved, uh, was not such a, such an un, um, unexplainable step. Um, the gambling was uh, unexpected, the interest in gambling, and it came about in this way. Uh, I was already, um, uh, I was doing a neuroscience doctorate at Imperial College in decision making, looking at ventral medial prefrontal cortex impairment as a predictor of early relapse in alcohol dependency. And all was going extremely well. It was all very interesting, uh, but there was one unexplainable factor and it was linked to a group of people who were doing very, very badly on some particular neuroscientific touch, touch screen tests. And I couldn't work out why that was. So I got them all together and I said, look, something's happening. Your results don't make any sense to me. You're very, you know, you're clever. You're able to do a lot of other things. There's no major global impairment, but you're just doing very badly on decision-making tests. And they said, oh, well, Henrietta, we are all problem gamblers, as they used to. Now they say we have a gambling disorder, but, you know, we're all problem gamblers. I said, what's that? You know, and I had trained uh, at this wonderful, you know, Charing Cross rotation at the Chelsea and Westminster. I had been, I, will, I had become, you know, a, a, a proper addiction psychiatrist without anyone ever telling me about gambling. Uh, and this is where it was at in those years. Uh, luckily, we managed to make changes since then. Uh, but that's how I became interested in the field. And this is the famous uh, Cambridge gamble task that Barbara Sahakian and her team in Cambridge developed. Uh, and it still remains one of the most elegant ways of understanding when someone does have decision-making issues around odds and calculating the future probability of things uh, because of the descending and ascending odds ratio and that uh, odds and that's and that's a, I, I, if you want to ask more about it we can discuss it but it, 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 it's beautiful um, so at the time of, of me realizing uh, that I was so interested in gambling that I spent six months 
uh, making index cards. I wasn't doing it on a computer. I was literally uh, filling in hundreds of index cards. Um, I still remember having uh, Jeff's uh, work on young people and uh, gambling and gaming and doing, you know, at least a hundred cards on your stuff, Jeff. Um, and I suddenly realized after six months, I had actually probably become an expert in the sense that I knew more than the majority of my colleagues about this particular issue, which was totally disregarded in England. So at that time, the English government was uh, talking about opening a super casino accompanied by regional casinos. The Royal College of Psychiatrists came to me because I'd bored so many people about gambling and how exciting it was that everyone knew that I was interested in what they thought was a total kind of, you know, ridiculous interest. But they said to me, Henrietta, I know we know you're quite junior, but no one wants this job. Do you want to mediate? <laughs> Do you want to be the spokesperson for the college on gambling? So I was like, well, yes, of course I do. And I didn't realize at the time what it meant because I was politically very naive. So I said yes. And the next day I had about 17 phone calls from the top journalists in the country wanting to interview me about the impact on society of having more casinos. I used a very WHO approach and I said, you know, it's very likely that if you have lots more casinos, lots more people will gamble. If lots more people will gamble, you might uncover lots more problems. And that's the, that's a take I do. But even then I remember needing to ask advice from senior colleagues abroad because I just thought, well, this is too big for me. I don't really understand the politics of all this. And I don't understand the science enough. I haven't had enough time to, to properly be up to speed. But nevertheless, it was a very fraught time um, because uh, you know, there just weren't enough people around to provide the information. But there we are. The other thing I realized was that as I was fielding all these calls, I realized that actually there was no clinic. Every time the journalist said, okay, so let's say that we end up with an extra few thousand or hundred, you know, hundred thousand, who knows how many more thousands of people will have a problem. How will you treat them? And I thought there's no NHS clinic for gambling, which is when I literally one day thought, well, there isn't one, so I'll have a go at it myself. And I, all, and I managed to persuade my trust, my NHS trust, to be the first ones to venture into this. Um, they were very kind. It took quite a long time. I had to sort of prepare a business plan, but we did it. And at that time, of course, um, the voluntary funds that were given by the industry, they were paying about 0.3% in those years, uh, were given to a charity that collected them the responsible gambling trust it was called at the time and they handed me some money and my trust match funded it so for many many years for over a decade we were a 50 50 enterprise um, but they said look try it out and see whether you you end up with any patients at the, at the time of course GAMCARE the the non-NHS clinic was working very well and was providing people with counseling services um, so it wasn't as if there was nothing in England but there were no doctors and there were no psychologists as such set you know in an NHS setting that's what I mean when we talk about the first clinic there were services for sure so this, uh, uh, this is someone's arm and it's got a monkey on it. And I use this to tell people, remember gambling disorder can happen to anybody and it comes in many shapes. And so this, this man was someone who was traumatized after his uh, years of serving in the army. And he uh, was driving a car and uh, driving a van and the tire burst. And he was so worried that he was being brought back to some sort of traumatizing bomb explosion that he thought I'd rather be dead than go through it all again. And he drove his van into a warp on purpose. He then ended up with severe brain damage, well, not severe, but it was frontal lobe damage that was severe, which led him to gamble everything he owned and drink 20 large coca-cola bottles a day that was his presentation when i met him um, and when i spoke to him he said that there was one other problem he hallucinated monkeys 
And I thought he was having me on. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, no, there's one sitting on your shoulder. I see monkeys everywhere. And monkeys were in the end what kept him from gambling because he used the hallucinatory monkeys to remind him that he shouldn't gamble. And he, and he had a tattoo on his arm to just uh, celebrate the monkey. And the fact it was, I see it as a sort of self-made stimulus control. There we are. But um, I haven't written about this man, but he told me, he said, Henrietta, you go out there and tell people about this illness and you can use this picture. Take a picture of me, he said. So I do this most times when I give a talk. And as you can see here, there is a list of my publications here. And they're not just my publications, they're publications from our clinic. So if you want to see what we do, you can have a look there. So one other lovely image is uh, to remind you that gambling disorder can lead people to take their lives and what happened was that I had a lovely patient who um, was going to kill herself if the council took away her cat when they rehoused her or rather rehoused her without allowing her to have a cat so I wrote a letter for her saying, uh, I truly believe that Mrs. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so will kill herself if you don't allow the cat to go with her to this supported accommodation that doesn't allow pets. And, um, you know, a week later, I got a note saying, thank you so much. I want to live again. My cat and I are well settled into our new home. And this is for you. And I looked at this thing and I thought, what is it? And it's actually a cow costume that you can put on a cat. And I thought that was a rather beautiful, rather beautiful present to get from her. And it always makes me think about suicide and gambling and actually what a, you know, what a dreadful thing. We'll talk about it in a minute. I'll speed up now for a bit because I, I have quite a lot of things I want to tell you about. You're, a, you're an audience familiar with gambling disorder, but obviously, just to remind you, increasing amounts of restlessness, irritability, unsuccessful efforts to control the gambling and a preoccupation with the subject, and the chasing of one's losses and the lying to others and the bailing out. Um, I will not spend any time on this because you do know it. Uh, if you don't and it's all new to you, then you can look it up because it's vital to the conversation. Now, moving on to the UK in particular, I'm using 2018 data because it got a bit complicated in, uh, later on in terms of the data and the, uh, and the gambling and the lockdowns. But in 2018, in 24 and a half million people in England gambled. Um, you know, over half of the population or under if you exclude the national lottery. Um, there was a very important report some of you might be interested in reading in 2021. So a lot of my stuff is quite recent. Um, and it talked about the fact that the UK has one of the biggest gambling markets in the world. Excuse all, all the typos I, as I did this late at night, but generating a profit of 14.2 billion pounds in 2020. Harms to have been shown to impact on individual families and wider society. And there's been a big move in recent years, the last three years, I would say, to kind of start to see this issue not as an individual's problem, but as a societal problem in the sense that we need to protect people. And indeed, what we realized at that point was that to do that, you need to have an evidence based approach. And we just didn't have as much data as we would have liked or the quality of data that we would have liked. So the dire need for independent research funding to answer questions that will then inform policy led us to request the ministers who are currently in the middle of signing off our gambling review of 2022 request. So we have been asking for a 1% levy uh, for some time, we were at a ministerial round table as experts advising our politicians only about two months ago and 15 experts round the table, every single one said we need a 1% levy because then you can actually fund all that is required. Um, what the report pointed out, and remember the, the, the Public Health England report is only listing high quality research and its findings, but just in relation to the UK, the highest 
links to harm uh, for young people were impulsivity, substance, alcohol, tobacco use, being male and suffering from depression. There were others, but those were the strongest. They also talked about the cost to society and economic burden, burden of harmful gambling. And they quoted it as about 1.27 billion. Now I'm on a committee now with the National Economic uh, uh, Social Impact, I can't even remember the name of this, very long name of this economic uh, group that is using professors of economics to try and see whether they can drill down further to really understand the burden because the confidence intervals are so big, but that's roughly what is, that's the going rate at the moment of what England thinks. And this is the, this is the Lancet Psychiatry article that I, uh, published with the group that I co-run in Cambridge. Gambling disorder in the UK, key research priorities and the urgent need for independent research funding. And I would you know, love you to have a look at it. You can access it online, it's now out. Um, uh, and again, uh, we will be following up on the various strands of research that we feel is needed, uh, not just in general to understand an illness, but very much to inform policy. At the moment, I go and sit in these Westminster meetings and they say, you know, what do you think? And I say, well, it's very hard for me to tell you because I don't have enough evidence base. And the minute I don't have that, I'm just giving you an opinion, which is, I guess, better than nothing, but it's hard to then base policies on. Uh, you'll be wanting to know what our da prevalence data is. At the moment, we think it's probably about 0.7%. There are different ways. This is from the 2019 BN British Medical Journal article by Heather Wardle, who you all know, or many of you will know. There is recent data that says it, the prevalence has gone down further. But without offending anybody, I do think that the methodology could be improved in, uh, and that potentially that lowering of prevalence might just be due to the methodology, but, but we'll see because there are going to be new studies soon uh, coming out and then we'll have another. It, 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 it's possible that it's gone down, but equally it's possible that it's gone up. Uh, we know that children uh, are gambling. Uh, it's not legal to gamble uh, uh, in England, but, but we know that they are. And uh, roughly 62,000 children uh, are estimated to be problem gamblers or have a gambling disorder. And we also know uh, that 7% of the whole population in Great Britain were found to be negatively impacted. These are, this is YouGov data. Lots of lots of media interest. This image comes from the time when the fixed odds betting terminals were causing people to bet 100 pounds every 20 seconds. They were deemed to be very, very dangerous. And it required a whole group of people to really push for government to do something about it, which they did. And they removed the ability to spend so much and they limited the number of machines. And this is what this is about. It, it required some people to really come out and talk about their stories and explain how addictive some machines are. Gambling is everywhere in England. And here's the royal family sitting on gambling adverts, which I always find very interesting. This is from a few years ago, maybe five years ago. I don't know whether it would happen now, but it might. Um, we know that we've become much tougher on, on gambling industry uh encouraging children to do things that are in any way linked to gambling or the potential of finding uh, a link in a kind of activity base so uh, uh well i'm i'm talking in the company of experts here but but we certainly we 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 see young people spending a lot of money on games on loot boxes who are then you know we base this knowledge on david on um, uh, david zendel's work are more at risk of becoming problem gamblers we also know nowadays it's going to be very you're not easily going to find images that are child uh, friendly on gambling products, but I remember from Jeff's presentations, you know, a decade ago that this indeed was the case at times there were gambling products that used images of um, of uh, cartoons. Uh, so gambling disorder is a public health issue, very, very important. Why is it so important? Because when I started my clinic, everything was uh, land based. Now, 
everything is online. You're not going to find a single person who is online unless they've had to sell their laptop because they were so addicted um, and they've got nothing left and they can't gamble on their phone because they haven't got a phone anymore. So everyone else is online. And that's, a, you know, that's a fact. So you've got that 24 seven av availability. Um, this slide is here to remind you that there are 2 million people at risk of becoming uh, problematic gamblers. They are the people who are already in our country gambling at some level harmfully, and they're scoring under eight on the PGSI, but they're still scoring something. And of course, we've got the crime, the physical health, the social isolation, all these things that you are familiar with in your own countries. And here is a picture of a man I never met, but he was the son of two people I hold very dear. The coroner's inquest on his suicide is happening now this week as we speak and the NHS and ministers and the Public Health England, everyone's being called to the coroner's court to investigate why this young man was being bombarded with gambling opportunities despite having self-excluded and trying to work out what role what role and what accountability and who is accountable uh, when a gam someone with a gambling disorder can't get away from the gambling. So uh, he was, Jack Ritchie was the son of the two people who set up Gambling With Lives. It's a charity that helps and supports parents of people who kill themselves because of their gambling. There are quite a few in our country. I don't know what it looks like abroad, but I'd be interested to know and indeed to link people up to Charles and Liz who have been instrumental in informing government about harms. Um, so, uh, so we know Australian research shows that 2% of suicides were related to gambling. We know that there's a Swedish study looking at times 15 suicide completion in treatment seeking populations. We don't have that kind of research in England. So I can't give you anything from our country, but if you have anything, from Canada, from America that you want to share with me, um, I would love to see that because I, I spend a lot of time advising and I would like to be able to share, share that. So we've discussed this already, so I'll move on. So what is it that helps? Well, in 2020, NHS England called for data sharing as being a very important thing so that we understand what, what uh, types of risky decisions and behaviors gamblers are doing and in doing so we can try and prevent either specific products from allowing people to play for too long or we can uh, identify people at risk and stop them from playing there's all sorts of thoughts about that I think it's just important to know that large data algorithms are important so bank cards we know that since starting the clinic one of the biggest steps we took was to work with banks to 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 create software that allows them not to be able to pay for gambling products and a lot of people are kept abstinent because of that uh, gamban uh, i don't know whether you have it um, in your countries but for us it stops it's software that is installed and then you can't take it away uh, because someone else installs it so you don't know the code to get rid of it and it basically stops you from accessing anything that is to do with gambling that's brilliant of course self-exclusion works and helps pre-commitment uh, long uh, what we need is to really understand what the harm is in relation to who is actually suffering who is doing what and to do that we're going to need to invest some money in a good longitudinal study, which we haven't as yet. Um, the Advisory Board for Safer Gambling, uh, which is a great body led by Anna van der Gaar, recommended affordability measures uh, needed to protect people. And we still see plenty of people who arrive having spent a year's salary you know, in a few days, that still hasn't changed. So why not? You know, how can people end up doing that? We now have primary care gambling services, and that's really wonderful, and we are hoping to expand those, uh, but the pilot has gone very, very well. Uh, we are at the moment, I, as, I, as I look at this slide, uh, yes, CBT 
uh, one to one or group. We also have some psychodynamic treatment, but most importantly, we do actually have the NICE guidelines, uh, the National Institute of Care Excellence. Uh, the first meeting, which lasted all day, was today, and I was sitting on that meeting. And um, as the psychiatrist, uh, there are 24 of us in all. And it, what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to give uh, the advice to everybody in the country as to what treatment is evidence-based for gambling disorder and what clinicians should do. At the moment, it's very much uh, the best we can do, we're gonna do. Yes, I prescribe naltrexone because the Monash guidelines say it might be helpful, but we want to get to a point where we're identi we can identify gaps in knowledge so we can commission new research and until then, do things that are not harming our patients and we can only do that if we work as a team because i am going to go on to this but from the one clinic that i set up in 2008 in 2019 finally we ended up just before that we ended up with one more clinic in the north of england and then the rollout of these eight more and then the plan for the next lot so that there will be 15 in 2024. So it's very important we all do the same thing. And also it's important to have parity of esteem for behavioral addictions in relation to other addictions and other mental health diagnoses. I've mentioned the naltrexone. Uh, we give it at 50 milligrams and no more. I, I'd be interested in, if anyone is an expert on this and wants to email me, uh, the reason why I can't go higher, even though I know that some of my patients would do even better at a higher dose, so for some of them it's not, it's just not a high enough dose, is that the only research we could find properly at the moment was John Grant's work uh, saying that it, he didn't notice any any greater benefits on 100, but I would be very, very keen. And also if anyone's planning on doing any uh, randomized controlled trials and you want to involve me and my Cambridge team, we would be very interested. So here I am in the middle because I was on my own for so long and then uh, uh, other doctors came on board so they could help me prescribing because otherwise, you know, it would always be like, you know, it would just all, always be me. So this has been really nice to share with colleagues some of the work. So this is an important, this is probably the most important photo of my career because a man who looks horrified staring at me is actually our health secretary, Jeremy Hunt. And he visited my clinic and I, I convinced him, uh, not only on my own, there were plenty of people who agreed with me, that my clinic needed to be rolled out to lots of other parts of the country because it was just not fair. And remember in those years, um, it, before pre-2019, um, there was no work digitally. So we weren't working on Zoom. We weren't working remotely. People had to come to my clinic, which was a national clinic. They took the train from all over England to come and be treated. And as you know, people with gambling disorder often wouldn't be able to afford the train journey for a start, uh, or they'd be working so hard they wouldn't have the time. So it, this is the moment that changed everything. 11 years of, I thought it was gonna take me a year to change it. It took me 11 years. So this is really good. Uh, and this photo I think will stay with me forever. Okay, so we have a, we have a UK National Behavioral Addictions Research Group in Cambridge. The, this is a group I published the Lancet piece, but there are gonna be lots more. So if you have any ideas about things you want us to look at and write about, and you want to join us for something, you can, you just need to email me. And at the end of this talk, there'll be my um, email. This is uh, an interview that has been watched by a lot more people than that now. Uh, the first time one of our patients decided to open up in public, this was during a lecture I was giving at the Imperial College, but that was filmed and he knew it was going to be filmed and the filming of it and the streaming of it on YouTube allowed an enormous amount of people to tell their story because someone had done it before them. Uh, this I'm talking about England, America, I know people have been doing it for longer, but for us it was a landmark and we are always very grateful and actually Owen Bailey sits on the NICE guidelines with me now because I employ him in my clinic so it, he went full circle, you know, he's now a worker in the NHS. 
Okay, so uh, the lived experience advisory group is also fundamental. We need to listen to our patients. We need to learn from them. So the last few minutes of my talk today are about the all party parliamentary group in Westminster that I advise. I'm not the only one advising them, but I do a lot of advising for them. And what do they want? Well, they want a statutory levy. They want all treatment to be done all severe treatment to be done by the National Health Service, they want affordability checks and they want to stop to free bets. And uh, they also want to, re to reduce the amounts players can stake online. And um, these are some of the many things they want, but I just included some. Other good things that have been happening, the online harms bill, the loot box consultation, everything kind of fits in with our field of gambling. And this is recent, this is 2021. Now, probably the biggest players have been the House of Lords. They sit alongside Parliament, they sit alongside the MPs, and they have created these amazing reports that are absolutely, absolutely um, uh, spot on. So they talk about the fact that 60% of profits come from 5% of people who are at risk of becoming problematic. Uh, they talk about um, the harm caused by gambling disorder not having received the same attention as harm from other addictions. And they talk about the amount of money that is spent on advertising by the industry. They've got 50 recommendations and they cover everything from an independent ombudsman to affordability checks, harm products review, and the fact that they support the NHS expansion. So um, there is an overlap. And in fact, the APPG and the House of Lords work very closely together. So hopefully all of these things are going to end up in the gambling review. Uh, this is just a quick thing to, about at the times we wrote a letter to ask if they could, during lockdown, could the gambling industry stop advertising just during lockdown, uh, which they did eventually, but then they, put out responsible gambling messages with their logos. So my patients say that it still caused them to gamble because they were stimulated. So to finish here, what will the gambling review cover? Well, we don't know. We hope large penalties and accountability, better regulation, age verification, adverts, the interface between gambling and gaming. We hope the statutory levy, this is our biggest ask. And as I mentioned earlier, the NICE guidelines have now started um, and we know that uh, we need to have more evidence-based, high quality research. Uh, I'm just gonna end here with a few titles of the books uh, that I've done that are very in England-based, I suppose. But um, if you're interested in our country and what we've been doing, then this is one of the first ones. Uh, we did something internationally on women with Fulvia Prever. Some of you will know her from Italy. That was uh, a beautiful book um, in, about women. This is in collaboration with Switzerland, uh, some great colleagues and the public health approach. Uh, this is a beautiful scarf uh, designed by my brother-in-law for the Medical Women's Federation that I was president of. So during my presidency, I invited him to design a scarf, which was lovely. He's a designer in Italy. Um, our meetings are on Tuesday mornings at the, at the gambling clinic. If you ever want to visit, you can. They're online at the moment, so you can hop on. And um, I'll end here just in time to have you know, a few questions. But as you can see, my website's there and um, the email as well. So um, that's it really. Um, and uh, I'll stop, I'll now stop sharing once you've had a chance to, um, uh, to have a look at these details. Um, Jeff, shall I stop sharing now? Are you happy with that? And re I'll reappear. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, Henrietta, I wanna, on behalf of everyone, I wanna thank you. Um, certainly for not only your presentation today, but your contribution to uh, helping individuals with gambling disorders, gambling problems, and for leading the UK in terms of developing a wide variety of treatment programs for those in need. Uh, you're just a one woman powerhouse. So thank you. And, <laughs> thank you. And again, thank you for presenting. I guess uh, while people are putting forward their questions, I have one question. 
Um, you've talked about the changing patterns of gambling behavior, going much more online, mobile gambling, uh, the intersection between gaming and gambling. What about online treatment? What's your, what's your thinking on online treatment? Uh, the yeah. UK is a fairly big country. And even though you're expanding the number of clinics, people can't always get to the uh, clinic. I'm so glad you've asked me this because you've really pinpointed a, a, an absurdity uh, that has occurred. So the 2019 National Health Service for England long-term plan that I was an advisor to in terms of the gambling side, it was a plan for, the, for, for everything to do with illness at national level, but I was advising the, the gambling side. Uh, we, at that time, had no idea about the digitalization of uh, treatment that was going to happen during COVID times. So we needed to set up the 15 clinics as a plan in order to have coverage to avoid what we call in England a postcode lottery. I don't know if you have that term, but we really have it. And it is something to be taken seriously. Things tend to be in the richer areas. They tend to be in the south rather than the north. And we wanted to address that. But what happened during lockdown is that very, very rapidly, particularly for the NHS, because the NHS takes years to make decisions about things like that. Um, uh, we quickly went online and we quickly started the delivery of um, Zoom meetings that were so effective that we stopped having any, uh, uh, sh no, any no shows. Everyone shows up. I haven't had anyone not show up for two years. Um, so we realize that there are many, many reasons. But uh, if you look at uh, the fact that many of our patients hold down two jobs, sometimes three, because they're desperately trying to repay their debts, you quickly work out that taking a day out to come to London, and then to do it every week to come to the groups is ridiculous. So by now, many people are back to seeing patients face to face. But my clinics, both the gambling and the gaming one with the young children under their duvets, you know, their parents can't get them out of the house for two years. How are you going to get them to come to the clinic? So suddenly we are treating our young gamers while they are sitting on their bed. Uh, sometimes they're gaming while they talk to us, but at least they're attending the sessions, right? So I, I haven't got, I'm not in any hurry to return to face-to-face -to -face work. I don't think our delivery has suffered in any way. In fact, I think it's made people feel very included. It's been uh, uh, very egalitarian, financially speaking, and we're gonna continue. The outcomes are just the same, so that's interesting. Um, people are still completing treatment. They're still uh, you know, three quarters abstinent at the end of treatment. We have very poor outcome. Uh, results in the sense of data collection at say we don't have data at three or five years we haven't been funded and we have no extra money so I haven't done that piece of work but there will be work done in the future on this. Yeah Henrietta do you think there are any characteristics of of gamblers who might be more prone to this online treatment? Would they be more likely to be online gamblers? versus uh, land-based gamblers, for example? So as I said earlier, because everybody is online, that distinction is impossible to, is impossible okay. now. You know, it, it, five years ago, you could have said, well, you know, there are some people who are maybe more, um, let's say more impulsive, they want to spend more money, they want less control, they're going to go online quicker, you know, maybe they belong to a different demographic, we can explore that, look at subtypes, but now everybody is online, uh, it gives them the secrecy, it gives them the, you know, I still remember my patients, as I'm sure some of you do, needing, needing to lie to their wives about popping out for a pint of milk um, in order to pop into the bookmakers, right? But now, of course, that doesn't happen. So I can't any longer even try to apply any scientific um, exploration of, uh, of who's online and who isn't. But I will say that... Um, maybe gambling more than other addictions are more suitable to online uh, treatment because I think 
uh, people are at home, they are, as we said, using the, their laptops or their phones, and they find it very easy to, to, to live and to communicate in a digital mode. You know, when I think I used to run the homeless addiction services in central London, people would inject heroin, and come up and see me with their sleeping bags, they had wounds, they had all overdose, they had all sorts of things. You know, you, we are talking about a completely different addiction. OK, if you're if you're injecting heroin, coming online is going to be impossible because you're not even going to have a laptop because someone will have stolen it while you're on the street or because you will have sold, it, et cetera. So, you know, these gamblers are holding on to their laptops because they want to gamble online. Right. So it's the last thing they sell. They lose their home before they lose their laptop. So so I think in general, um, it's suiting the type of disorder very well, this digital delivery. And in fact, we are now using digital delivery of training and that's working very well. Uh, personally, it doesn't work so well for me because I'm an extrovert and I enjoy people and I love to share ideas, as I'm sure some of you on this, uh, on this talk uh, also agree with. Some of the most productive particularly in relation to research ideas, really have come from sitting around a table after a conference presentation. So, so that has, I, I think we have slightly become a little bit stale about the research creativity because of Zoom. But on the other hand, the patients have benefited. Well, thank you. Um, there's a lot of compliments on the chat line oh, uh, good. From, from all over the world, actually. Oh, wow. Uh, not just from the United States and Canada, but we have somebody from Kenya who is most appreciative of well. And um, one of the things I should mention to everyone is we will have the uh, tape version of Henrietta's talk uh, online in the uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, a number of people have asked if, if you could share their, your slides with them as well. Um, and we will try to get Henrietta's slides that we will post both on the National Council for Problem Gambling's website, as well as the International Center for Youth Gambling Problems and High-Risk Behaviors. Um, you're, you're certainly a leader, have been a leader in the field and are still a leader in the field. Um, the question I have is um, one that's often given to me, and that is, how quickly have you seen the migration between gambling and gaming? Uh, David Zendel, who you mentioned earlier, also gave a talk uh, to this group. Um, and it's interesting that you as well as and have started a clinic for gaming in the UK. Yeah, so, so the National Center for Gaming Disorders is the 15th clinic. So the 14 are gambling, and I managed to slip one in. <laughs> <laughs> I just pointed out that we would never know what on earth was going on if we didn't have at least one gaming clinic. Um, David is a, is a dear, dear colleague who is very able, and uh, as well as being great company. David has shown um, that if you start spending too much money uh, on loot boxes, you are more at risk of becoming someone with a gambling disorder. It's, it, you know, we need people like David who have a full understanding of both pathologies and, uh, and are very at ease in terms of interpreting data uh, to give us some of these answers. The thing that I found very interesting is that when I started the gaming clinic, I had no idea who was going to show up. First, I didn't quite know whether anyone would show up particularly. I, I expected they would, but I had no idea it would be as many people as they have. So we started at the end of 2019, just before lockdown. And we were due to see 50 people a year. You know, I had to keep it very low because I could I had no idea. Um, but actually, you know, uh, it's more like 200 people a, a year. Now, some of those are parents of people who are too young to come because 13 is the lowest threshold. Uh, sometimes it's parents. And of course, we treat affected others. But a lot of them are gamers. I'll come back another year to talk about gaming. Um, for you if you want. Uh, but essentially, the, 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 the issue is that there are some shared commonalities between the brains of uh, young gamers and young gamblers who do things to excess. And I, and I do believe 
that uh, although they are quite separate populations uh, in terms of their presentation, when I meet the young gamblers, um, they don't share an enormous amount with the young gamers we see. However, the ones who will be very extreme will be at risk because their decision making is uh, is compromised they will not be able to postpone gratification the ventromedial prefrontal cortex side of things is you know is problematic the uh, do dopaminergic reward pathways are problematic in that sense and this leads people to potentially if they come across gambling potentially be more at risk of gambling disorder. Uh, and that's another reason why we are so keen on age verification and on making sure that people don't get exposed to, to adverts, for example, when they are young, because that's how you're gonna convert the gamers into gamblers. Remember, we don't have an enormous amount of data uh, on a population uh, because uh, in terms of migrating from one to the other, because, uh, it's only quite recently that very young children are gaming from a very young age and then doing it uh, on a daily basis and, and then moving on to potentially gambling. So longitudinally speaking, we are now beginning to have proper long, you know, enough data now. But um, many of my gamblers, what I'm trying to say is, many of my gamblers didn't, ga didn't gain because they were just too old to do that. It wasn't offered to them. So I think we've got a whole new world to explore there. And I'm very keen on longitudinal studies in relation to that. Yeah. That's great. Uh, one of the questions is, have you worked with incarcerated gamblers in the UK? And any thoughts on this population? Yeah. Um, so I've worked with a lot of people who have come out of prison or who have gone to prison because of gambling. Um, and I always feel I've written an editorial for I think it was the British Medical Journal about the fact that to me, even though it's now been removed, the criterion of committing illegal acts was such an important one because it was that moral threshold that gets crossed, which to me is an indication of severity. Um, so, so, uh, but uh, what I am aware of is a lot of information about gambling and forensics because we have done we've done publications looking at illegal acts in 1200 patients that we had you know so we know what people get up to we know that mostly they get up to the wrong things because of the gambling so the you know these problematic gamblers are not actually out there in a kind of sociopathic way trying to get acquisitive crime because they want a better watch you know they are committing crimes because they're sick and they're wanting to fulfill their needs. They're wanting to fulfill their cravings. And I always try and talk about this because I, I'm not sort of defending the crimes. Clearly people have accountability, but I do want to, to be seen as a sort of mitigating circumstance that actually someone has a disease. Um, there is a commission on crime and problem gambling that I sit on. Uh, in England, and it's it, it's published some papers, so you might want to look at that um, if anyone's very interested. And just to finish on this question, our trust has been running identify early identification and interventions in prisons as a special pilot scheme that's going now. So we are aware that there is a higher prevalence. That's great, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, who is also serving on that commission, uh, will be presenting at our national conference uh, this summer on some of the early findings, some of, some of the early issues with around uh, uh, crime and, and gambling addiction. Fantastic. And listen, I'm seeing there are 38 questions. Any of you who are on Twitter, you can you can send me yes, a message publicly are. or <laughs> public people, people need everyone, you know, I have so many followers who would be interested in what questions are they? What questions are coming out of this talk? And answer them for everyone's benefit. So I'm very happy to do that. If you if your question doesn't get answered today, you can ask me uh, on Twitter and I'll answer it. Yeah. Maybe not immediately. Lou Clark, who you know well, of course, um, uh, said fantastic talk. He wanted to ask about um, the, a little bit more on the coroner's uh, role in suicide, because as he said, and as we all know, um, gambling often does not leave a physical trace. And so I think these inquests are really important to, to tease out some of those, those deeper root causes. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? that? Um, there's a big movement at the moment <clears throat> to try and get coroners 
to record the presence of financial harm in people who have uh, committed suicide. And of course, they are not going to be, if we are only going to do it in the sense of, did this person, was this person diagnosed with a gambling disorder? Well, clearly we're not ever gonna get anywhere, but I do believe that it would be possible uh, to uh, obtain financial information from people who harm themselves and to look at the forensics of what they were doing before they did harm themselves in order to understand whether gambling had a part. There's got to be something that changes in relation to um, how, how coroners will be able to at least take into account finances when people hurt themselves because or kill themselves because at the moment they don't. And all these families are saying, so much could be learned for the future and nothing is being done and more people are dying. Now, this is another piece of very important research. At the moment, we don't know the numbers in the UK. In England, we have no idea. People are quoting one or two deaths every day because of gambling. I have no idea what it is because the most important thing, I think, when you're an expert in something is to make sure you either have some very clear evidence base about who did the research, what was the methodology, where was it published, and was it replicated? Uh, and we need that. And then we can really, but if we don't get the coroners on board, we'll never know. Well, that's great. Uh, again, I wanna thank you, Henrietta, uh, for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedule and sharing your insights with us. Uh, once again, we'll have the entire presentation online in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, please email Henrietta if you have any further questions or contact her on Twitter. Uh, she's got a very large number of followers there. So and thank I'm you sure so much, you'll get Jeff. a response. And thank you to all of you and, uh, and goodbye, goodbye. Thank you, Henrietta. Bye -bye.